So to get that forest edge soil ecosystem, we have to provide fungal foods. And in terms of thinking about fungal foods, just take your mind to the edge of the forest. What happens there? Goldenrod grows, raspberry canes grow, they fall over, they decompose. So plant matter that grows up, falls over, decomposes, that's good. Um, branches fall, that's a source of wood chips in a way. They're not chipped, but it's a source of wood chips. Leaves fall, and that soil in that forest edge ecosystem is not disturbed. So we basically just have to emulate it by providing the right kind of fungal foods. Now when we talk about the soil food, food web and nutrients being made available to the fruit tree, well to plants in general, we, we, we introduce the concepts of mineralization, that's the microbe eating microbe and minerals, nutrients being released in, as a waste product, and assimilation, and that's the microbes taking back the nutrients and storing what didn't get used, so nothing washes away, so to speak. But there's another aspect of this, and that is humification. So certain species of fungi break down certain kinds of organic matter to produce humic and fulvic acids. So when we talk about the soils of the northeast, as opposed to the prairie soils, which are grass-derived, our forest-derived soils have a real long-term fertility factor. And it's through humification, through the building of humic and fulvic acids, that northeast soils got to be so rich. Now, over the course of times, humans deplete that. But as we start to understand this process, we can actually do a lot of soil building for the long term in our orchards. And that comes down to understanding which kind of organism is breaking down which kind of organic matter. So back in the, the 70s and 80s, up at Laval University in Quebec, researchers started to look at what can we do with the tops of trees left over from logging jobs to build agricultural soils? You know, obviously, they, those tops could be left in the forest to build forest soils. But what can we do to, to kickstart fertility action in agricultural soils? And this is where the concept of Ramiel wood chips came into play. And here, there's really two things that define what makes for a good Ramiel wood chip. One is the size of the wood that it comes from. So when we are chipping branches, the tops of trees basically, or clearing along a road underneath a power line, or keeping the pasture from getting encroached by the forest, we're taking down little trees. So anything that is smaller than two and a half inches in diameter at the branch end out to the twigs and the buds is what we're looking to work with. This is because all those nutrients being stored in the cambium Proportionally, there's a lot more of that than carbon woody matter in the heart of the branch. So the, the carbon to nitrogen ratio of those wood chips is on the order of 40 to 1, maybe up to 70 to 1. And, and that's a real fungal sweet spot. We're going to hear that 40 to 1 number a couple more times today. Um, but when you get into the bigger wood, the stem wood of the tree, the carbon to nitrogen ratio can be as much as 700 to 1. So when, as an organic gardener, you hear don't mulch with sawdust, it'll tie up the nitrogen. Mm -hmm. Well, sawdust is the stem wood. That's where the saw cut out the two by four, the two by 10. And when we're working with the more nutrient rich portion of the tree, we're not, we're not locking up nitrogen, particularly when we're laying it down and the new material added, there's an interface below that where things are really in balance for the, the biology. Um, so we wanna use the smaller portion of the wood now, when the wood matter, the organic matter, comes from deciduous trees, hardwood trees, um, that is broken down by a certain grouping of saprophytic fungi I'm going to call the white rots. That's just a generic name for the saprophytic fungi. It's the white rots that take soluble lignans and create humic and fulvic acids. And, and that's that humification process. That's what we want underneath our fruit trees. When the material comes from softwood trees, conifers, be it fir, spruce, pine, um, it's a different set of saprophytic fungi that break down that material. And I'm gonna call those the brown rots, and that's not related to the disease you see on the peaches or the, the plums. The brown rots, in the process of breaking down that cellulose-rich material, 
produce an allopathic, allo, I can never say that word. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> I can spell it, I see it as I'm trying to say it. I get trouble with that middle syllable. A compound that inhibits the growth of deciduous trees. We're trying to grow deciduous trees. So if you come in there with all kinds of softwood bark mulch, and, and you can get a lot worse than just simply small pines and small firs, uh, you can get that bark mulch at the landscape center. Bark mulch is the big thick bark that comes off the saw logs. And now we're talking about a lot of tannins, which also suppress growth, and also getting this brown rot saprophytic fungi aspect that inhibits growth of deciduous plants. So the rules of thumb here are in chipping wood, whether you're doing it yourself or you get one of those companies that's clearing along the power line to come and deliver the wood chips to you, um, don't go more than 20% softwood so that it's mostly hardwood. And if you do get a load that's mostly softwood, you have to let it sit a year. So it still has organic matter and nutrients that are of value, but it's not going to have those soluble lignans that build the long-term soil in the same way but you're going to get beyond that phase where it inhibits the growth of deciduous plantings. If you went to the landscape center and not only got bark mulch, but you decided it would look really nice if you got the red dyed bark mulch <laughs> or the black bark mulch, <laughs> well, that's really, really toxic for the biology that you want. When we get into this kind of regional nuance, like out in California, it's eucalyptus. I mean, that comes with an oil that kind of pretty potent. That's also something people typically let sit a year or two. Or if you're dealing with black walnut, um, the juglin in the roots inhibits the growth of other plants. Mm -hmm. That's something you have to kind of dilute by letting time work it for a while rather than go directly out there with all kinds of that particular plant material. Another aspect of, of this mulching is, you know, this is not about some uniform look. This is about forest edge ecology. And so big chunks and actual twigs as part of the mulch. You know, I am not Martha Stewart. I'm not here to teach you how to make this really beautiful orchard in terms of some kind of human idea. I'm talking about the biology and the long-term breaking down of this organic matter, the suppression of other grasses underneath the fruit tree is part of what I'm doing here. So one source of Ramio wood chips are the prunings that you take off the tree because they are small in diameter and they are from a deciduous tree. And I have a chipper that I run off the back of my tractor in the same manner. If you take off some small branches and cut it into two inch, 10 inch, even 20 inch lengths, as long as it lays flat to the ground, the dynamic I'm trying to get you to achieve will happen. If it's a branch that's all kinds of gnarly and, and sticks up in the air, you got to cut it small enough so it gets down to the ground. And that has a lot to do with the difference in organisms that break down material. But prunings alone are a great source. So most of my smaller stuff, I take my hand snips and just drop it down to the ground. And I use this for the bigger branches. Patrick. Do you worry about um, whether or not they're pathogens out of those branches? Like it looks like it's disease, would you not use it? So now we get into what are the potential cankers on fruit wood. And one of those is something called black rot. When wood is up in the air, uh, I have a friend out in California, Tim. And Tim had this idea, he has about an orchard of about 30 acres. And he had this idea that every year he would build up the prunings around the border of his orchard to keep deer out. Mm -hmm. And it did help with the deer. But now, rather than breaking down fairly rapidly to the action of the saprophytic fungi at the soil line, that wood took a long time to break down. And after three, four years, one of the organisms that gets in there is the black rot fungus. So in terms of doing its job, breaking things down, that's good. The black rot fungus, being a fungus, goes through a sporulation cycle. And when those spores land on the fruit tree, on the apple tree in particular right now I'm talking, they cause a disease called frog eye leaf spot. So if you see these purple lesions that then go hollow in the middle, um, that's gonna be frog eye leaf spot. And the source of inoculum is either gonna come from those piled prunings or leaving a dead branch on, in a tree. 
that just rots over time because it's up in the air. The difference when you get that woodsy matter down to the ground is that different organisms take it on and take it on a lot faster. And so black rot fungus is not going to be prevalent down there. Now, if you cut out a limb that has an active canker of black rot fungus, that spring, that could be a source of inoculum. So if I saw a lot of that, I'd probably burn that, or at least I would chip it. If I saw a lot of fire blight cankers, particularly now I'm talking late winter, early spring, and you're seeing that it's an active canker in terms of orange edges, which means that it's disseminating bacteria, which is going to spread throughout the orchard, I'd also deal with that. But if it's more or less a dormant canker, it's not been turned on yet for the spring season, and it's chipped, and you get it down into the ground, that organism doesn't thrive in that ecosystem. That disease organism, in terms of fire blight and black rot, need to be up top. So that changes things. So if you see active cankers and it just feels bad, yeah, get it out of there. But you don't have to worry about it to the same extent. Similarly, you will have probably been advised if you're growing raspberries, every year you prune, the I'm talking about the June bearers, the ones with the two-year cycle. Well, could be the others, but you're advised destroy those prunings because they are a potential source of disease, particularly viruses. While on the forest edge, no one destroys the prunings. They decay, they break down. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is kind of a mini form of hugo culture. I just take my wheelbarrow loads of raspberry canes pruned out of the, the beds and put them in low spots, and then I throw some compost over. It's, it's a new organism breaking it down, but that material can be returned to your orchard soil rather than just burned. Mm -hmm.